Okay, should be live now, but I'll just double check. Hmm, it says we're now streaming live on Facebook. Huh? Wonderful, there we are. Hello, Facebook. Ah, all right. Anything else I need to do there? I will share it along, just bear, bear with me a second. Turn it down. Wouldn't it be great to have a person in the background doing all this? Yeah, <laughs> and it's amazing, isn't it, that we're all our own sort of TV producers <laughs> and, <laughs> and, oh, and yeah, with <laughs> everything, bit of everything. It's quite cool. Yeah. You know, we'd have makeup artists, we'd have everything. <laughs> Fighting. <laughs> yeah. Not just this round thing that shows up on the glasses. <laughs> I've got one of those too. They are good. Have you got a big one or something? Because I've got some of those small ones, the little that sat on top of the computer and then it kept breaking. So I just used a big one in the end. This one's massive. The other one was probably two thirds the size. But it was very flimsy. It was very light wobbly comes in handy if you're doing makeup tutorials as well yeah <laughs> <laughs> your other job <laughs> is that for your makeup tutorials yeah i wasn't say that was very sexy stuff wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> all right just stick that there welcome anybody who's oh we do have some people hi just bear with them just bear with us a second and I apologise for that. Well, do I apologise? I've got my giddy head on today. I've got my giggly, giggly head on. So anything could happen. How are you finding the energies at the moment? Now, is that a question to me or <laughs> to everybody else? I don't. <laughs> mm, yeah, actually, we'll get into that after. Mm. But yeah, feel free, anybody watching, to. Um, to let us know how you're going and feel free, I never say this, but feel free to say where you are and what you, not what you're doing, it's kind of obvious what you're doing, you're watching us, but um, write anything you like in the comments. Or questions. Yeah, good idea. Thank you. We've done this before, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so while people are gathering, I'm Denise the host of Love Speaks Love. Welcome everybody. And my lovely guest today is David Manning. Welcome, sweetheart. It's really nice to be here. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me. You're a very popular man. I can feel that in the comments. You're a very loved, a well-loved man. Good. <laughs> That's a really nice thing to hear that I didn't quite know how to respond to that. <laughs> Thank you. That's lovely to hear. <laughs> yeah. Putting it on the spot there. Um, so when we start Love Speaks Love, what we normally do is a little bit of a heart to heart connect. Um, so I am going to start that in a second. And thank you for joining us, everybody. And whether you're with us live now on Facebook or catching it later on YouTube or watching the replay, welcome, welcome, welcome. You're all here in this, in this now moment, whenever that is. <sighs> okay, so let us get started. So if you're in a position to close your eyes and you feel to, then why not just do that and let us all breathe love into our heart space. <sighs> and breathing out anything that you're ready to let go of, anything, any old emotions, anything at all that your body's ready to shed. And extending that heart awareness out now to the heart of Gaia. And as we do that, feeling Gaia's energy moving into our hearts, into every cell of our bodies. Ah. 
and feeling Gaia's love and her appreciation, her gratitude for all of us and her recognition of all of us. And extending that heart awareness out to the heart of the sun. And as we do that, knowing that the solar energy is moving into our bodies, into every cell, into our hearts. And extending that heart awareness out now to the heart of Source Creator. And feeling the love from Source Creator moving into our hearts, into our bodies, into every cell. And just feeling that connection between all of our hearts, bringing our conscious awareness to that heart connection. And if you wish to call in any beings that you personally acknowledge or work with, any beings of light, and David, if there's anything that you wish to add, please feel free to do so. Thank you, Denise. There's a, a, a team of beings that uh, have been present in my life um, for a while now, since 2010, and that's the lion-headed beings. Uh, often we know Sekhmet um, as the lion-headed goddess uh, from Egypt, but there's a whole race of lion-headed beings, and they're very present in this um in this time for all of us, as we're uh, drawing into the uh, the Lion's Gate on Monday, the 8th of August. So I just welcome their presence. And as we were meditating there, uh, Mary showed up very strongly. Um, so I acknowledge and welcome her presence too. Beautiful. And as you say that, I get Merlin popping in as well. <sighs> okay, so when you're ready, just moving your body if you wish to in any way and opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Hmm. It's always so hard to open. <laughs> I, I just know. want to, <laughs> I could just stay in that space with my eyes closed. Ah, so the lion, the lion headed beings, do you want to, do you want to, I'd love to hear more about them. Do you? Why don't we start with Merlin, actually? Okay. Because um, Merlin has been showing up um, as my higher self. Every time I connect with my higher self, Merlin is the figure that shows up immediately and that's been happening now for the past three or four months I guess now he's always been a figure in my life and when I first started going to psychic development classes at the College of Psychic Studies in in London back in 1989 this was we were doing a, a an exercise to meet to meet your guides and Merlin stood in front of me and I said oh are you one of my guides and he laughed and said where did you grow up and I I grew up in a town called Pembroke in South Wales um so I was thinking what well, Pembroke and he said no where did you where 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 did you live uh and my parents had bought a plot of land and built a house um on a crossroads called Merlin's Cross um and they moved into that house uh I guess a couple of months after I was conceived. And so my even my fetal development took place on Merlin's Cross. And as children, we used to play on this crossroads and there was a seat there and we would pretend to ourselves that Merlin was buried under the seat. 
Um, so he was always a figure in my, even in my childhood. And, you know, you grow up with the stories of Merlin and stuff, but he was present as a, I don't know, as a force. And then years later, when I was traveling around sacred spots in the UK and I went to Tintagel and underneath the castle, there's Merlin's cave. When I look on the map of Merlin's cave and if I took a, a line going north, then the place I lived, Merlin's cross, is almost exactly above Merlin's cave. And I always wondered, was it called Merlin's cross because it was on a, a crossroads with that? line of energy. I don't know about that. Um, maybe that was wishful thinking on my part. But um, so I'm sort of intrigued that now he shows up as, you know, whenever I'm connecting with my herself, it's Merlin is the figure that just moves in um, very strongly. So uh, how for you with Merlin? Merlin started popping in within a couple of years of me learning Reiki. And my Reiki master's close friend used to work with Merlin a lot. So she used to mention him. And I lived in Stockport, which is not that far from, oh, what's the place called? Alderley Edge. And Alderley Edge in Cheshire is very linked with Merlin energy as well. Now, I, I didn't grow up there. So that, that was where I was living at the time when Merlin kind of was making an appearance. Um, I guess in childhood he, he was around, as you say, in stories, but it wasn't really until my 30s that I started working with him, I'd say. And when I was living in Australia and I wrote a, a young adult fiction book, and I knew there was going to be, there was a wizard college, and I was looking forward to creating a character, Gandalf. I loved Gandalf as a child, like, and I, I see Gandalf and Merlin as, as really the same energy. So in that in that way, he was he was kind of present with me. Um, but uh, yeah, I was looking forward to creating some kind of wizard character. But Merlin came in and said, "It's me," and I'm like, "Can I do that? Like, can I have actual Merlin as the character in the book?" And he's like, "Well, yes, you can." <laughs> um. So yeah, it, it's just continually got closer and closer. And even more so since I've been back in England, like everything I put on, it's Merlin. And often, often Mary Magdalene. And it's interesting that it's a combination of those two rather than Yeshua and, and Mary Magdalene. But it seems to work, work really well. And my feeling with Merlin, like it's it's interesting and and I've heard it said that there were many Merlins, that it was the name of a kind of like a lineage of, of sages, you might say. And is it an archetype? Is it a is it a being who lived and ascended? I, I don't know, you know, he feels very much like an ascended master. And I think anyone that's doing work on the land, um, he just seems to appear. And I, I love how across the world it is. It's not just a particular UK thing. He, he just seems to be bobbing up everywhere. And maybe it's easier to associate with him than say Buddha or Yeshua or someone that maybe we kind of, maybe Merlin feels a bit more homely and a bit more like us, I don't know. And not constrained by any of the ideologies and, and religion. But I think certainly for me, there's a very strong link between the man we know as Jesus and, and Merlin. Um, and, but also Merlin has told me that he was Thoth in um, Egypt and, and Atlantis. Uh, so that that's another. And who was the other one that? Uh, Hermes. Hermes, yeah. Um, and Saint Germain apparently is yeah. a, of Merlin's incarnations. Now, of course, I don't know that, but he did tell me that he was um, the dying Eumastoth in uh, in Atlantis too. So, and I think that 
you know, it's it, it, you know, just as the Harry Potter stuff came around to really help people awaken um, the magic that we have latent within us and to keep hold of that strand of energy or that stream of energy rather than strand. I think Merlin is is very strong now just to really <laughs> encourage our awareness of the magic that is available. And as I'm speaking this, there's a black cat, not mine. I don't have a cat, but a black cat just walking past the window here on the on the deck outside, which makes me uh, makes me laugh. It's lucky the dog's gone out for a walk with somebody else because he'd be shouting. <laughs> he'd be shouting quite loudly now otherwise. <laughs> so um so yeah, I think that black cat just uh, signifies something. Do you think that's Merlin shapeshifting? <laughs> Probably. And you know, it was one of those things. My grandmother was a was a bit of a witch, um, and when I was a, a a child, she would she'd have people knocking on the back door quietly, and they'd come in, and it would all be a bit hush hush because she lived in a a little uh, Welsh town, um, which was chapel was the religion. It was a strong religion, and it was a bit hellfire and damnation. But she'd be reading tea leaves in in the back kitchen, and I would sit under the table. Um, and she gave me a little black cat, a china black cat, to watch over me. Um, and then when I moved to this place, that black cat got lost years ago. But when I moved to this place, I found a huge china black cat, which I promptly bought, and it sits on the fireplace. So, so I think these symbols are. I mean, in a sense, lighthearted, but they anchor us into some of these streams of energy that are really, uh, really quite beautiful because the cat mythology. Um, when I was working with animal communication um, and tuning into black cats in particular, because we had a black cat who taught me to walk or helped me learn to walk when I was a, a baby because he was an old boy by this time, but he would let me dig my hands into his fur and pull myself up and balance against him but when I tuned into black cats they are almost like an open doorway into other dimensions complete completely holding those those borders wide open and really important allies in that sense and I think that's why they got that reputation as being um you know the witches allies uh because they really are uh, amazing, the most amazing portals. I think all cats are, but the black cats in particular really hold those spaces wide open. So, uh, so yeah, which I guess takes us to the lion-headed being. So, <laughs> I also before we go there, I'd love to hear more um, about your grandmother. Like, how much of an influence do you think she had on then on what you're doing now? I wonder. I mean, that thing of of people knocking on the back door and it being a little bit secret. She lived with her brother, uh, my uncle, my great uncle, who didn't approve of that sort of stuff. So it was hush hush in that respect. Um, and I, I did, they lived in a town, you know, 30, 40 miles away from where I lived. So I wasn't there all the time, certainly. But, um, but I certainly have that memory of her uh, reading people's tea leaves. And my mother was one of three sisters. Uh, my mother was the youngest of those three sisters, but we, the children of those three sisters, a group of cousins, referred to them as the three witches because they was all they would all know what was going on with each other. Um, <laughs> you know, so they would be on the phone and talking in Welsh. And, um, but they would always have a, a strong psychic bond not that they called it a psychic bond but they just they just knew um and uh so i think yeah that's a part of a part of my my lineage in a sense they didn't activate um that in any full regard but my mother was certainly a healer um my father was a doctor my mother was a nurse both my parents were addicts crazy crazy addicts so it was difficult growing up with them but both of them were uh you know if they'd come 20 years later or whatever they would have been they would have been working as healers i think you know and, and that would have been um and they did their work in 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 that unrecognized way where they could i watched my mother once 
and it's funny because I've just been writing about this. Uh, when she, and I, I didn't know what was happening because I was about 16 years old at the time when we'd gone shopping to the local supermarket and she made a beeline for this man walking towards us down the aisle and he looked a wreck. He looked a completely shambolic wreck. And she just walked up to him and put a hand on his arm and started talking to him. And I knew somehow that I couldn't intrude on this conversation, but this energy enveloped the conversation. And even at that age, I knew that this was something that I shouldn't intrude on. And I just watched. And looking back, there was a transmission happening between my mother and this man. And uh, when their conversation ended and she returned to, to me, his wife had died a few years, a few days before, and she, she was in a full empathic flow in that conversation. And that changed the energy of that space in the supermarket. And it was, I had no idea what was happening at the time, but, but that really imprinted itself on my awareness. Um, and so later on, when I was doing that sort of thing, I was like, oh, that's that's what was happening. And I know that the energy of witnessing that impacted me somehow, because like I say, it burned itself into my memory in a way that I feel the insignificant um, shouldn't have, you know. So, um, so, uh, so, yeah. And then, you know, my father as a doctor was very, was a very well renowned doctor lousy parent but a very well renowned doctor um and you know even 30 40 years after he had died people were still saying oh you, i loved your father as a doctor you know he was very very caring with his patients and very intuitive with his patients um in a way perhaps now the doctors really can't be when i go to a gp i'm astounded that they hardly look at me they just look at their computer and see what what you know what they're going to be prescribing and it's it's there's no interaction and it's like wow this is this is really strange you know so it's a, it's a whole different world and where you you mentioned that you were kind of picking up on the energy but you didn't really know what it was would you would you say that you were sensitive to energies even back then yeah, I I was um, I was a multi-dimensional child, mm. uh, as many of us <clears throat> are. Uh, I was born in the sixties. I had a traumatic childhood, um, and that served to keep me out of body, um, and being out of body for a long period of time meant that portals and lines of energy that normally would close down as we embody ourselves stayed wide open because I was active in those lines of energy wandering around the universe when I could perhaps have been <laughs> um, a bit more present on the planet. And uh, I really didn't choose to fully commit to this incarnation until I was almost 40 years old. Um, and uh, you know, that was a, it was a, it was a, a tricky first 40 years in a sense. It was touch and go a lot of the time. And um, so I was very sensitive. I was very intuitive. Um, I was away with the theories. I would spend hours in the garden or in the fields, just uh, imagining conversations that I was having, you know, and, uh, and I used to have a lot of out of body experiences, which, um, would terrify me because I had no control of them. I could feel them starting uh, hours before I would go to bed. And then as I was drifting off, I would somersault out of my body and um, expect to find myself in the, in the bathroom, which was behind um, my bed. And I wasn't, I would be in, a, in this vast black empty space. Um, and then I would, I have no more memories of that, but I now know that that was my, star family in a sense again keeping contact open um providing some sort of solace because i was bereft as a child the family i had incarnated into was was completely crazy and it was a very disturbing childhood in that sense you know so it uh, i needed that um a sure reassurance i think of <laughs> there being a purpose i have a memory of being in my cot 
and having a very tall figure standing over me saying, you've got to stay, you promised, you've got to stay. And me <laughs> really wanting to leave. And um, so it was, it was, it was along those lines, you know, but uh, yeah. So in your out of body experiences or when you were away with the fairies and as you say, multidimensional, would you like visit other planets? Were they, were they kind of, clear things that you were you were seeing no not at that stage no what was it but what what i would have i mean often when i was drifting off to sleep or if i was just relaxing deeply there was always for me in the first i think seven years of my life a voice in the side of my head that was was very oh what's happening <laughs> you just <laughs> did a somersault on the screen <laughs> um <laughs> so there was always this voice in the center of my head uh, that explained to me that it was going to have to leave because I needed to be more focused in life, and it was it was going, and that too was a was a big sense of um, grief for me, uh, mm. the closing down of that, <clears throat> and I think I felt betrayed um, and abandoned. Uh, but it was important for me to focus more in life. Now, it didn't really work because I started my my own addictive process very, very early on um, using petrol fumes as the first the first thing to get high on. Um, I don't recommend that one to anybody. <laughs> it's really rough. Um, and from there on, it escalated, you know, onwards and upwards. Um, as a way, in a sense, of maintaining an out-of-body experience, a permanent sort of out-of-body uh, and lacking in presence experience. So, um, so, so yeah, so there was that voice. And often when I was drifting off to sleep, and I had this awareness of stars. So I remember talking to older kids about an awareness of stars and the other side of the sun and they were like how how do you, you how you know they were confused as to why I was talking about this now I was confused about why I was talking about this because I had no way of knowing that stuff but I but there was stuff I knew and now I don't remember what that stuff was um and also there was this thing of I would be drifting off to sleep and my eyes would be closed but in my inner world I would be looking through the eyes of somebody that I think was perhaps on the other side of the planet. It was like sharing a dual um, incarnation, maybe. Um, so I was aware of parallel existences, although I would never have used those terms in there. Uh, and also, the, you know, all of that thing of, I remember sitting for ages with a ping pong ball on a string, trying to get it to move. <laughs> 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 and you know so that sort of stuff fascinated me Yuri Geller was in the news when I was a child and all of that sort of stuff and my parents my father had books on do you remember all of those things about the the South American healers that would dip their hands into people's body what do they call them the, um yeah. the, the psychic surgeons then that yeah. didn't you know he had books on all of those so I would read all of those sorts of things and and um and it, so there was always this awareness and this fascination. I was reading the books of Erich von Daniken. Um, oh, I can't remember. It. Chariots of the Gods, that sort of stuff. Um, and Supernature and Lyle Watson and all of these sort of mystical, um, mystical books, in a sense, because I knew that this stuff was, was real. Um, and then it awoke again when I was 27 consciously and I, that voice came back. Um, and by this stage, I was using a lot of drugs and uh, I thought, this is the drugs. <laughs> um, but I knew it wasn't because I recognised the voice, you know, so. So, yeah. I turned the camera around before because the my iPad, the camera's on one side and on the screen, it looks like you're talking and I'm just like looking away from you. So that's why I turned it round. <laughs> okay, so you were 27. Um, were you a garden designer then? You, garden design came in at some no, point. No, I was a, um, was a trainee addict at that stage. <laughs> <laughs> that, was my, um, that was my ambition and that was my <laughs> love. That was my great love. And my that's all I wanted was to be really, really 
completely drug fucked basically to have as much sex and drugs as possible um so that was my focus i worked at lots of different jobs and it wasn't as i say until i crumbled until i you know really uh i i i'd had this awakening and i loved what I was experiencing in terms of I was going to the College of Psychic Studies and and having a lot of really extraordinary experiences and I'd been invited to work in the healing clinic you know within two weeks of starting my first ever healing course there um not to work with 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 clients but to sit with other healers who were working and, and observe and help out and all of this sort of stuff and and um but my addiction was was very strong and i knew that i couldn't uh, i knew that what i was touching in my inner landscape wanted all of me and i knew that i wasn't prepared to give all of me at all i wanted my addictions as well i loved that side of my life the crazy drug fueled sex fueled um very hedonistic life i loved that too um and uh but i did know that i was going to have to give it up but i just wasn't prepared to cut to the chase uh i played that for way 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 longer than i should have done and it almost killed me um and i had liver cancer back in 2001 2002 I was HIV positive by this time, um, had been for 10 years, and it was an HIV related liver cancer. But the doctors were saying, okay, there's nothing working here. The chemotherapy is not working. You've got a few months to live. Um, and all the time, you know, all the while I'd been having guidance, strong guidance around this and, and guidance said, look, you know, you've been living as if you wanted to die all of your life you're about to get that request that desire met is it really what you want and it was like oh <laughs> maybe not so when i chose to live and it was a very stark choice it's like you know a big kick up the backside just if you want to live live if you want to die die it makes no difference because you'll be doing the same work anyway so just make your mind up basically and it was like oh <laughs> okay <laughs> um and I chose to live and then the cancer was gone very, very quickly. Um, and I think simply because the choice to live meant that there was more of my life force staying present in my body than there had been before. Up until then, I had been avoiding the current of life force by not taking responsibility for my life um, at all, really. Um, and as soon as I said yes to life, then that meant that there was an intention to live rather than a deep-seated intention to die or to not be present. Um, and so the cancer served its purpose in that sense. And it was a liver cancer. I was being asked, will you be the liver of your life? You know, And up until that point, I was saying, no, <laughs> I won't. Um, and, uh, and it is true to say that, you know, I thought, okay, I've cured myself of liver cancer it's going to be easy from here on in and that was when the shit hit the fan <laughs> um, and all of the stuff that I was all of the stuff that I would have died in order to avoid came to the surface um, and so it was years then of working through you know a lot of of deep dense shadow work um, in order to <laughs> to repair the the damage I had done um, and uh and I learned a lot, you know, it was, uh, it's nothing is ever wasted. That's, that is the beauty of this journey that no matter what path we've taken, no matter how extreme things have been, um, no matter what we've done or had done to us, it's all becomes the most wonderful, juicy richness that serves your your greater purpose um and that's very very beautiful so yeah well, I've been in 12 step fellowships which are amazing in terms of if anybody listening is dealing with any sort of addiction there will be a 12-step fellowship that you can use um and it's a very thorough grounded spiritual path 
and because it's peopled by other addicts who have done the same as you and have told the same lies and cheated in the same way as you, um, they see through your bullshit and that's what addicts need really. <laughs> um, and it's, it's great, you know, so I would recommend that to anybody that um, is struggling with an addiction uh, or not struggling, <laughs> just go, <laughs> um, yeah. Wow, what a journey. So you went on the 12 step program and then, is that the same thing, the 12 step program? You, you called it something slightly different, but it's the same. Yeah, on the 12 steps, on the, on the step, the steps. To, yeah. to that point then. And so when did you start then after doing all the internal stuff, sharing your healing energy and doing the stuff that you're doing? How, how did that come That about? had been going on for a long time. And that's the surprising thing, you know, yeah. because that comes through the multidimensional aspect that is sort of untouched by what the, the human stuff is doing in a sense. And so the multidimensional me would could witness the silly, silly, crazy, ridiculous games I was up to and know what I was doing and hold it to some extent. Um, but it could also operate uh, in a sense with some sort of in independence of that. And so it's really uncomfortable to live a life that is split. That's mm -hmm. what I learned that we have to be congruent. Um, otherwise it's us that gets ripped to shreds. Um, and, and it's really, really painful. Um, but all of that was very much present and an active part of my life. Um, you know, from the age of 27, it was like a light, a light bulb went on. And I can't say I have any more awareness now than I had then. It's just I'm living more true to it now than I was then. You know, then I thought I could have it all. I thought I could have my addictions and the drugs and all of the crazy, you know, all of that stuff as well. <laughs> and you can try for a while, but it doesn't work. You have to bring your life into alignment and it can happen slowly, 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 slowly. Um, or it can happen really painfully, um, the more resistance we have. Uh, but I was given a huge amount of leeway um, with which to hang myself, basically. Um, and, and I did have a lot of fun. I had great times. But because I always took things too far, then those great times turned to miserable, miserable, miserable times, you know, when when I had taken it so far that I, I couldn't quite let it go and I wanted then more than anything to let it know go but it had a life force of its own because I had put so much energy into it and so then it was like oh god help me you know and um and I was helped by falling uh, having a bad fall my last big drinking session involved a fall off a windowsill um that almost killed me and I broke my leg and, and woke up in hospital, having brought myself to my knees, literally. <laughs> um, and uh, and then a year later, after stopping drinking for a year, um, I had the liver cancer. And, and that was the real sort of wake up call. So I don't know how I got there. Um, yeah, I can't quite remember what the question was now, but it's... Uh, There's a lot of scope for us to play around in this. And as soon as we get serious, then it gets serious with us, mm. in a sense, you know. Um, but as I say, I don't think I know any more now than I did back then. It's just that I'm living more in alignment with it and not trying to escape. Um, and that's, uh, that makes for a much smoother ride, you know. What you said about it had so much energy because of the amount of energy that you put into it. 
I've never heard anyone express it quite like that, but that's really, there's so much truth in that. Yeah. 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 My, my desire to escape. Um, well, but it's like we set a ball rolling and it gains pace as it as it rolls further down the hill, you know, and all of a sudden you realize that you're running after it rather than it running after you and um, you're playing catch up. And and, uh, and that was scary. You know, that was a deeply humbling experience because I'd always been thinking, yeah, I'm in control of this. I, I've got this sorted. I know what I'm doing. And it was like they came up. I was like, oh, my God, I have no fucking idea what I'm doing and I need help. You know, I really need help. And um, and that's humbling, you know, and that's mm. we all get humbled on this journey over and over again. And often it's the body that humbles us. You know, often we're brought to our knees by our physical circumstances. Um, and often it is actually the physical body because we don't listen to it and we don't pay enough regard to it and we take it for granted and we treat it abysmally. Um, and then it trips us up and says, yeah, you can't do this without me. <laughs> so you better start paying attention. And uh, and it's it's very humbling. Um, and it's very beautiful, too, you know. So it's, uh, yeah. OK, I want to pick up on the animal communication. That's that's another facet of your diamond that I wasn't aware of. Um, and this is something that that's so interesting interests me as well um I find it fascinating and and something that I have done um but it's something that I would love to get more deeply into did that happen spontaneously for you was it just like if you're picking up psychic messages was it just like turning the dial to a different I, I went off and studied it with various teachers and whatever, but I always had this memory of being a young child, an infant, with that black cat that helped me to learn how to walk. Sooty, his name was, totally completely, politically incorrect name that we wouldn't use these days. But having my forehead pressed against his forehead, and I, it was one of those things, I should be able to know what he's thinking. You know, I should be able to, you know, definitely this this thing and and um and I can't remember when that 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 real desire came back. But what I realized was that everything is a field of energy, uh, and everything is in deep communion with everything around it all the time. Every cell of our body is communicating with with the whole world. Um, and we get so caught up in the idea, you know, when I trained at the College of Psychic Studies, there was, it was quite an old fashioned institution. Perhaps it still is. I haven't been there for a few years now, but the psychics and mediums were elevated onto pedestals and it was all talked about in terms of oh, a gift you're very gifted and I used to hate that word because it just makes me cringe slightly <clears throat> and the word psychic I think is a, a loaded and old-fashioned termed term because we simply are in communion with the whole of life all the time and we have so numbed and dulled our senses for many, many reasons over many, many lifetimes that we're left locked into this very limited range of communion. Um, and yet, as I say, the whole world is this vibrating, pulsating, multicolored, multidimensional pattern of energy that is seeking to communicate with us. And, and animals are another set of those frequencies. Um, and so I worked with a, an amazing woman called Anna Breitenbach, who's a South American. Um, I love her. South American goddess, actually. Yeah. Is what she is. Uh, and if anybody's interested in her, there's a beautiful, beautiful um, YouTube thing on, of her deep communion with a, with a black leopard um, called Spirit, Diablo slash Spirit. Um, that is a very moving, moving YouTube video to watch. And, and that got a lot of, of, of airplay, I think. Um, 
and she's an astounding, astounding uh, communicator. And I was lucky enough to do a couple of journeys with her in 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 Africa and some online stuff and and some stuff when she came to the UK. Um, and she would never term it animal communication. It's just interspecies communication because it involves the whole range of species, plants and animals and extraterrestrials, interdimensionals, it's all just there for the communion. Um, she specializes in, in what we term animal communication, um, but it really it's interspecies communication. And it is if it's like, well, if you want to talk to the dear departed, that's one set of frequencies. And if you want to talk to plants, that's another set of frequencies. Trees are another slightly different wave band, nature spirits. They're all just different wave bands in a sense. And it is learning to, you know, we are lucky enough to have or to occupy all of those wave bands or to have them all available to us. We're not locked into any particular dimension, although we have believed we are. Um, and what's happening now in our world is more and more people are breaking out of or being broken out of the, the shell, the tight structure um, that we have created for our existence and finding that <laughs> they're having dreams and communions, um, communications with all sorts of, of um, beings and fields of intelligence that they hadn't considered possible before whether that's the beautiful tree in your garden or that star that catches your eye night after night or the fact that your mother is trying to pass on a message and she died five years ago you know all of that sort of stuff more and more people are waking up to it and it's all um it's all the same in a sense it's just different wave bands and there is that lovely analogy of of the radio transmitter you know you just tune the dial and that's a useful visualization to use in a sense to tune your dial to cats dogs trees you, stars you know you can do that and and your system will automatically start to focus in that particular direction um and we do have the capacity to to listen to it all to receive and communicate with it all so um so yeah wow that's amazing i i love anna she she is an incredible incredible being and that video that you mentioned i've watched that so many times i still cry every time i know every I know. you know the point i mean, I mean in, in the video in the south african um yeah. ex-policeman <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, when he starts communicating with um, Diablo as he, as he still was then. But yeah, Spirit, that, that was just, yeah, it's incredible. And there's, you just can't refute her work. You, you, can't, you can't dispute it. it. It's beyond, yeah, yeah, she's incredible. So if anyone's interested in that, do check it out because it really is an amazing. She came to Byron Bay and spoke to the shark. This is when I was living in Australia and because um, there'd been a lot of incidents between the sharks and and what she said was incredible. She said, tuning into them, she said, first of all, they don't like eating human flesh. She said, they gave me like the flavor of it and it's really salty and it's really unpleasant to them. Um, but the energy that the surface have is similar to the shark in terms of catching a wave, it's quite predatory. And she said, just send out a message to the sharks before you go in saying what you are and what you're doing there and they'll leave you alone. And I, I did notice afterwards that there were fewer, and I'm not saying that's because the humans had seen the video, but I, I feel her connection with the, sh with the sharks kind of shifted things somewhat. Mm. Yeah. So the lion being, the lion-headed beings. <laughs> Years ago, I was, back in 2010, I was uh, a teacher that I was hanging around with. She was a, a big part of my life over a long period of time. And she was a, a powerful, powerful teacher. Um, and she was proposing a journey to South Africa to see, to see 
to see the white lions. And at that stage, I was uh, not wanting to go on a journey with this woman. I'd been on several before and I was that not really interested and it was expensive. I didn't really have the money. And uh, uh, although the white lions intrigued me, um, So I had dismissed the journey. And then what happened was I would have a, every time I would meditate, there would be a lion just up here. Uh, and I, lovely, that's great. And I took no notice really. And um, the day before we were, or registration for the trip, was, or the, the morning that the registration for the trip was closing, I woke up and sat up. And as I sat up in bed, there was a white lion, there was a lion right there. And as I sat up, um, I realized that it wanted to communicate with, with me. And as soon as I asked that, I just said, do you want me to go on this journey and the land move from there down into my heart? And it was like, oh, OK. So I said, OK, well, you're going to have to sort the money out then because I haven't got it. Of course, the money came in very, very quickly. Um, and we were going off to South Africa to see the white lions. And again, a lovely, lovely safari journey was planned with lots of different exciting, interesting uh, elements. And the one thing that wasn't pleasing me was the fact that I was going to have to go along with this teacher that I was not particularly enamoured with at that point in time. It was 2010 and the, uh, the we were travelling in two different parties. So one group was going one day and then two days later the rest of the group including this teacher was due to be flying that Icelandic volcano <laughs> blew its top the second party didn't leave London because the airports were closed so so I'd gone in the first party and had this amazing journey without the teacher that I really was in a lot of resistance to and that meant that I had a much freer journey I had some amazing experiences with those beings, the white lines. I mean, I remember them just sitting in the road and we were in the the Land Rover and just sitting and still, and the transmission was just, just extraordinary. Um, and they truly were our um, star beings, the most extraordinary star beings. And it wasn't just them. I mean, I remember walking up into the hills. Everybody else had gone off on a safari and I had decided to stay on my own in the camp. Um, I always tend to, you know, whenever there's a group activity or whenever I'm with a group for a long time, I tend to need to take myself out of the group just because I get overwhelmed by group energy after a while and I need to be on my own. So I said, no, I'm going to skip today's safari. I'm going to sit in the camp. And I wandered off into the hills um, at one stage and, and uh, just behind the camp and was just sitting on rocks overlooking this beautiful uh, camp in the South African bush. And before I knew it, I was surrounded by a troop of baboons and I thought, oh shit, <laughs> they're all sitting there and they've got teeth that are two inches long. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And I just sat there and watched and they watched me and there must've been about 40 or 50 of them. And I thought oh, I could be in really serious trouble here. But it was again, a lovely, experience of just thinking well just sit here and open your heart and allow that and they just sat quietly and peacefully they weren't particularly close to me but I didn't feel um scared after I had just um grounded myself and sat with the experience and then I wandered slowly back down um but you know there were lots and lots of amazing transmissions from giraffes and elephants and tawny lions as well as the white lions and and um, and since I've been lucky enough to go on a few different journeys to Africa and always had those just very intimate moments with animals that have been um, profound anyway the lions um, the meeting in other dimensions with lions shifted from the four-legged lions we know to, um, it started with a cat being, a cat goddess, Bastet, sat over me. And so I was meditating and, and she was present and completely enveloped my home form, my whole form. 
and sat like that for about 10 minutes. And I knew that I was being, I could feel my whole system being worked through by her presence. Um, and then she, uh, well, then she integrated. And that was that. A week later, Sekhmet came and did that. And then I started being taken out of body by a team of lion-headed beings who took me to various planets and temples on planets that look just like the temples we know from Egypt. Um, and at one stage, Sekhmet was, was bathing my feet and she said, you're one of us. Um, and we are architects and designers and geneticists. Um, and you're our representative here on the planet. You're, you're grounding our energy. Now, my understanding is what I was told is that the lion headed beings travel the universe, kickstarting life on a planet when it's ready to begin that experiment. Um, so they bring genetic material to start the process. I think there are other groups that do that too, um, but certainly in our DNA, there are the lion headed being stranded, strandings. They're, you know, they are a part of our DNA, a part of our heritage in a sense. And I think that's why so many people now are having experiences of them because that's awakening from the inside. Um, and so they're always a part of the work that I do. Um, and of course, at first I was awkward and shy and embarrassed about introducing them or talking about that, um, but that's, that, that wears away after a while. And you think, oh Christ, I don't care what people think anymore. <laughs> and it just is what it is. And people think what they think and that's that. Um, but we all are, an extraordinary hodgepodge of DNA. You know, my understanding is that our DNA has been brought together from all over the universe. And there are many, many different elements to that, different parts of our makeup. Some, you know, lovely, some not so lovely, and we're integrating it all um, at this point in time. And there's nothing we can leave outside of the field of our heart in a sense, it's that inclusion of all of us that is so important in terms of our transformational journey. You know, it has to all be included in the field of our heart. We can't say there's a piece of me or a race of beings that I don't like and they're the bad guys and I want to hold them out because you can guarantee that they will be a part of your DNA too. Just in the same way as, you know, often somebody will, will have a real problem with a parent. And regardless of the personality issues involved, and we all have personality issues involved with our parents, it's useful to make friends at the level of DNA, at the level of the genetics with your male lineage or your female lineage, because otherwise you're literally closing down a lot of the avenues of expression in that lineage. So regardless of how you got on with your mother or father, you might have hated them as a personality and that's okay, but you can still go into the DNA and open that up because if we project that hatred or dislike of a particular parent, we can often serve the purpose of closing down all of the gifts that come through that stream, through that um, lineage. Um, but you don't have to accept and embrace the parent. You can just do it at the level of DNA. And it's the same with all of these different races of beings. You don't in any way have to appreciate or want to express, you know, reptilian um, tendencies, but there is extraordinary wisdom within that field of expression too. And you can open that up um, without uh, drawing on perhaps some of the, the less lovely tendencies of those races, you know, it's uh, our heart knows how to filter all of that stuff and pick and choose exactly what is useful for us, our heart and our higher self, you know, it's, um, it's lovely that we don't have to make those fine decisions we can use that catch-all phrase that if it's for my highest good and trust that our higher self does that filtering you know yeah beautiful so the lion's gate is this a particularly special time of year because 
for you working with the with the lion-headed beings? They, I mean, I was always a bit cynical about these sorts of dates, you know, and who, which one of us had heard about Lionsgate, you know, 15 years ago, it wasn't a thing, was it, you know? Um, so I don't remember when it was. One of the big, I mean, I was probably 2006, because it was the eighth of the eighth and the two and the six made an eight. Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, 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 this, these, these three dates, these are just man-made dates. And I got completely sideswiped by the energy. Um, <laughs> and I was, I was meditating and I was taken out into the sun. I was just pulled out and dropped in the sun. And I was on fire for days. Um, and it was like, okay, I need to pay attention to this. <laughs> and um, I wasn't in contact with the lion-headed beings or that they weren't in contact with me at that stage. So it was afterwards. And as soon as they had made contact, that was one of the things they said, we would like you to hold teleconferences on the solstices and equinoxes and on the lion's gate. And with the solstice and equinox is at like at the actual time of the solstice and equinox. So if it's 2 two thirty a.m. in the morning in the UK, that's when I'll be doing a teleconference. And they were always very clear that that's, that's really important. And now I love doing that. And I've been doing those for years. And now lots of people do it. But back when I was starting doing it, hardly anybody was making any... Um, any big deal of of the solstices or equinoxes or or the lion's gate and now everybody is on board with this stuff and everybody is feeling the huge impulses of energy that are available to us and these impulses they are like big waves in our evolutionary process and they push us they carry us and they pick us up and push us further up the beach um than we would otherwise have been. And then there'll be, you know, the next big wave after this will be the equinox, the September equinox, and that will push us further up the beach again. You know, each wave that comes along, we think, oh my God, it can never get any bigger than this. And of course it does, because each wave is also a training process that trains us to expand and receive more. You know, these big influxes of energy literally open up our energy field they stretch the the meridians if you like and we get used step by step by step to to having more energy flowing through us and that's we are unlimited beings but because we have lived very very extreme um extreme limitations for many many lifetimes and we're now breaking out of those limitations um but that can't all happen at once I think perhaps for some people it can, but it's usually a very shocking experience if it does, you know, and for most of us, we get the real lovely, gentle ride of having it done incrementally, which doesn't send us mad. <laughs> it appears to send us a bit mad, but um, uh, but we integrate very quickly as a rule and um, and find ourselves expanded with each one. So, so this Lion's Gate, which is on, Monday, the 8th of August, is bigger than ever before. Um, it feels it feels like the energy has been very, very present in a way that I've not experienced before. Um, and a lot of people, myself included, feel that we're building to something. And it may be that tipping point, you know, when enough of humanity is awakened, whatever that means. Um, and I think that looks like very different things for different people, um, but enough human energy fields on the planet are open to and receiving consciously, uh, or maybe not even consciously actually, but are receiving and downloading this energy and anchoring it for the planet. Um, and I think perhaps we're, we're heading in the direction of a tipping point for that, that sh shifts us into a, uh, a different field of experience at a collective level. Um, but what I'm noticing more and more is that it's like there's a skin, this thin veneer of crazy <laughs> on the surface out here that 
you can dip in and out of as you look at the news and think, oh, my God, really? <laughs> as you look at perhaps the politics or, you know, the, the choices for party leaders and this sort of stuff. And it's like, really, <laughs> Are those the choices we've got to be our leader in this country. And then I found I, I, I can dip into that, but I sort of drop underneath it. And there's this other field of energy that has nothing to do with any of that and makes that other stuff look so unreal and so silly because this is the vital juiciness of life, of truth, of reality. And I think more and more people are becoming very disenchanted with that thin veneer of, of crazy and recognizing that there's this much slower, still a quieter, richer pulse um, that is truly life enhancing and that is that is real and vital and connects you to other human beings rather than disconnects you and, and it connects you to nature rather than fractures you and I think more and more of us are dropping into that field um, and letting go of the other you know and that's and that's really beautiful um, I live in a town and, and on the coast that seems to support that in a sense because it is a bit of an alternative sort of town anyway um, and I think that's why I, and I was certainly moved here um, it wasn't a choice that I that I made consciously I didn't even know this place existed but but it, you know I think a lot of people are being moved to locations now that support that experience you know Silly is a wonderful word for that. <laughs> what a, a veneer of crazy, huh? <laughs> yeah. So you're doing something on Sunday for Lionsgate and, and Monday, is that right? Yeah. So on the Monday, I'm doing a teleconference, a usual one of my usual sort of teleconferences, which will be a paid teleconference. I like to keep my charges fairly reasonable. So my teleconferences are usually £15 a pop. Um, but on Sunday, as a way of preparing for that and just coming into alignment, I'm offering a free teleconference as, as well. I haven't posted that. I will probably do that tomorrow um, and put that up on my uh, website and send a newsletter out about it so that people um, can access that. And you'll need to register, but there'll be no charge for that one on Sunday. And that will be a really lovely way just to come into alignment with the energies with... Um, well, certainly with the lion-headed beings, with uh, completely forgotten the name of the star now that is uh, so prominent at this time of year, the blue-white star that is called uh, <laughs> um, I'm looking at you expecting you to know the name as <laughs> well. Um, that's a star planet. Sirius. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we work with the energies of Sirius. We work with the uh, lion-headed beings. And, of course, the energies of our sun. The energies of Sirius flow through our sun and the energies of this planet. So we're working very much uh, for our own development. But we also, because we usually have quite a big... Um, planetary wide field with you know usually a couple of hundred people involved then we hold a big space and work for the planetary collective as well um, and I think more and more groups are doing that and that, that has a really big you know I used to think oh I don't think this is doing anything but now I get to see from out there looking into the planetary field and it's like oh it does it really does have an impact when you know hundreds of people gather with the same intent the same focus it's like yeah that does have a big impact particularly because all of our teams the multi-dimensional teams that work with us are really really happy that groups of people get together so they can use those fields of energy to move a lot of energy in and to pull a lot of dense energy out as well you know it is always the field that does the work rather than us doing the work, but we hold space and an awful lot of stuff happens. You know, it's um, it's very beautiful. I just got a flash as you were saying that of, you know, the potential of millions of us. I don't think we're far off that. I, th mm. I think that'll be in, in the next couple of years. Is, is that, yeah, 
I certainly think that's possible. I think. And a huge shifts from that, go on. Yeah, no, and I think that's in part, you know, as more and more people become aware of these big pulse points, like the dates, like the equinoxes and solstices, and, and you don't have to be on the same teleconference or doing the same meditation. It's just that same focus, that same awareness of, of the possibility, in a sense, and that your field, your human energy field, can be used to move a vast amount of, men of energy through for you, you know, positive transformation for you, but also on behalf of the, the wider collective. And that is one of our deeper purposes. Um, is that we we are used our energy field is used for transformation for large-scale transformation um, and at those deeper levels we don't need the transformation because we're already whole our personality thinks it's running the show but but has not nearly as much to do with it as it thinks um, and you know our multi-dimensional self knows exactly what it's doing and, and, and where it's going but the more of us that join in those fields. And what I've also seen for years now is that many human energy fields now are holding large spaces. So many miles across, stabilizing um, large chunks of the planet. And that those uh, aspects of our energy field that are beyond the personality then those are all linking up and connecting and creating the most beautiful network of light around the planet you know and that's strengthening and strengthening i think every day you know and so pulse points like lion's gate uh are really significant uh markers in this um in this overall movement and um it brings a lot more people on board, I think a lot more people are awoken to the potential and to the times that we're in um, by these huge downloads of energy that happen rhythmically um, on the planet. It's interesting you, you say about Sirius actually, because I had a very strong experience in 2015, which again, it, it was an 8 8. I don't even know if I knew about Lionsgate then I, I, for quite a few years I'd, I'd known that you know the six six seven seven whatever they were 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 significant dates but it was the, the Syrian high council that kind of popped in <laughs> as I was going to bed but I didn't realize that for another year I didn't actually ask until you know maybe I don't know a year and a half later I was like who are who are you by, by the way <laughs> ah okay um so you mentioned when we were talking before the call that you've been to Egypt before. How how was did you have a strong connection with the Sphinx when you went to Egypt? Tell me tell me something about Egypt. Particularly not. And when I was there, I had a very I've been a few times now, and I've had very powerful experiences. Um, It's, <laughs> it's difficult, but often, you know, members of that, um, what's the word, uh, pantheon of gods that we know of Egypt, a lot of them animal headed, show up in my uh, inner life. Horus and Anubis and Isis <clears throat> and... Um, Sekhmet and her family, uh, Sobek, the crocodile-headed god, a lot of them have shown up over the years. And I have had a lot of experiences in temples that look Egyptian, but could be Atlantean, that could be on another place. You know. So I think the um, civilization that we know of as Egypt is probably a much deeper civilization than history is currently telling us. I think it has a, a longer span and it's a portal in itself that you can move 
through the back of because it's sort of where our recorded history really takes off and of course there are other civilization before but it's the one that takes us back into Atlantis we can sort of walk and I had this experience years ago when I was doing a teleconference on Egypt of literally being walked through a museum into the Egyptian chambers and walked at the back of the Egyptian chambers through a door that said above it Atlantis, you know? And it was like, oh, and that's, and I think, <clears throat> so Egypt, we can use Egypt as a, as a portal into those areas that we don't have a his, any historical data from, but we all have a deep racial memory of, and the earth holds the memory of, um, and that, can give us access to stuff that we have no other way of knowing yet. I think there will come a time when there is, um, when scientists have caught up with us in a sense, you know, um, when it is understood that our history is much, much deeper um, than we're currently being told. So I think Egypt is a, is, is a portal. It was, once I was doing a piece of energy work with somebody and the lion headed beings had come in very strongly and were conducting this piece of energy work. And I was watching them clearing curses, Egyptian curses from her body. And they were apologizing to her through me for the misuse of high wisdom that happened in Egypt because Egypt was already quite a step down from where we had been. Um, and so there's a lot of beauty, you know, the deeper we go into Egypt, but it already was, was quite, uh, quite low level compared to, um, what we had access to before. And I think Atlantis was probably quite low level compared to what was before that too, although Atlantis was a long, um, was a long over you know took place over a long time period and, and there was a, a a dropping down but that's in a sense our journey through the procession of the equinoxes we have these high points low points high points low points and that's the cycle we 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 move through um and at any point i think individuals can get off that cycle can break free it's just that at this point we find ourselves in now um there's the opportunity for a mass, um, a mass breakout, as it were, you know, a lot of us are realizing that it's time to, uh, to break free of the limitations and restrictions. And we're, we're moving from, you know, extreme density in that cycle up into, um, well, who knows, actually, I'm not quite sure I have the words, but we're moving certainly from extreme density, which is why it's such a struggle at the moment, into uh, ever increasing fields of light. I can't even imagine at all what it what it can be like. And I don't even want to try to, because I don't want to limit it. You know, when I get Christmas presents early, I never try and work out what they are. I like to save it to Christmas Day. <laughs> I like to like, so it just feels the same for me. It's like sometimes I'm always the one hunting in all of the cupboards to find out the Christmas presents and <laughs> always or eating the Easter eggs from the back <laughs> and wrapping them and then putting the wrapper back on. I was always no, no, no capacity to de delay gratification. That's the hallmark of an addict, I think, is that. <laughs> is that. So, so, um, but with this. Uh, I'm being trained to be patient because it never happens on my time scale. Um, and I thought we'd have it done and dusted by now, you know, back in <laughs> 20 yeah. years ago. I thought it would be over by now. And here we yeah. are. Um, well, it, and it, it, it is strange. I think that split is becoming stronger, that thin veneer of crazy and the growing field of loveliness that is very available. Um, it's just a bit of a shame that the thin veneer of crazy is holding so much control. Um, but uh, I, I think, that, well, I'm sure that will give at some point. Huh? So you're going back to Egypt next year? This looks like it's going to happen. We're in very early planning stages and 
me and a good friend who happened to, he had been uh, attending some of my teleconferences, I didn't realize, and then he happened to move to Hastings um, and we met and he um, has run quite a few sacred journeys to Egypt. And that's never something I have wanted to do. Um, that seems like asking for trouble <laughs> to take a group of people um, to a place like Egypt. But he has a lot of experience and we get on really well. And I think, oh, it would be interesting if nothing else. And so we're looking at the possibility of running a journey to Egypt in February of next year. A lot more details will follow if it's going to happen at all. Um, we have a lot of planning and talking to do in the meantime. And actually, February isn't all that far away, is it really? If I think about it, I think, oh, it's months and months and months away. And um, time flies so quickly. So if we are going to do it, we will need to get details out probably by the end of September, I think. And then so that gives people uh, a chance to make a, a clear decision. But um, yeah, that's that. It looks like that's uh, well, it's certainly at this stage a possibility. And uh, yeah, I look forward to it becoming a reality. Yeah, that's exciting. Mm. Is there anything else that you wish to share about before you rush off and make your apple and blackberry time? <laughs> <laughs> I was picking, picking blackberries this morning. Um, it's easy to lose track in these times when there's a lot of fear um, and a lot of pressure and a lot of scary things, you know. We have been a very manipulated race of beings and that manipulation and control is is wanting to tighten its uh, its hold. We can be jerked around by things like money and inflation and um, the threat of diseases and uh, all of that. And it's easy if you focus in that world of crazy to think, fuck, this is all going tits up, you know? It's all, we're going to have in a handbasket. And I too have got lost in that and wandered down fearful paths in my mind. And just this week, was it this week or maybe last week? Probably last week, actually. I was brought up short and told, stop this. Pay attention to the truth because this is going to be okay. It's not. There isn't going to be a huge crash. There isn't going to be, this isn't a um, disaster movie you're in. Um, it's not going to move in that direction. Trust, trust this process. And that was really, really useful for me because it's very easy to allow the fear of the collective to take a greater and greater space in your own field without even realizing that that's what's happening. Um, and it's important to pay attention to that stuff because it is so sticky and pervasive. Um, so that's what I would say is that my guidance for what it's worth, um, has just been very, very clear that this is not a disaster movie that we're all starring in or that we're all bit players in. This is um, a very different story and it's up to us to write that story uh, with every breath we take and with every intention we focus upon. Um, but I think because we judge things on how they have been and our past experience, as you said, it's difficult for us to imagine how it could possibly be. But as more and more of our multidimensionality opens up, and it is literally like going from a version of your world that is one continent wide to suddenly discovering that there are six other continents that you have to explore. And that's what happens when light influxes into a whole other field of your inner territory that hasn't 
up till now opened up for perhaps thousands of years. And in that space, then there's a huge amount of wisdom and experience and space, spaciousness um, that opens up. And that's happening for millions and millions of people all the time now with these influxes. So we don't have the capacity to imagine really because we do judge it by by our past but hold space for that when i was dying of cancer um and i'd been told by two teams of doctors that i probably had months to live i was uh, telling this to a friend that evening um and as i was telling her this story that the doctors had said nothing more we can do you probably die within a couple of months in my right ear, I could hear anything is possible. Anything is possible. And it was just being whispered here. Yeah? And I was sort of not paying attention. It was like a bit like a fly buzzing around there. And I was, you know, caught up in the drama of what I was telling my friend. Finished the story and we turned on the television. And it was the first pop idol. Um, it was that year. So Will Young and the other guy um, were on. Um, and the announcer, as we turned on the television, was saying, and here's Will Young with his new single, Anything is Possible. <laughs> and so we didn't like that program, so we turned it over, and it was the Salt Lake City Olympics. And the announcer was saying, and in the men's slalom, anything is possible. <laughs> and so I paid attention to the, the field of anything is possible. And that field was like a huge golden orb that saturated my cell tissue in the world of anything is possible rather than the world of you're going to die in three months time and that allowed that gave me time to make a different set of decisions about what I was going to do with my life um, and I think we're the same we're in that place where we haven't yet realized that anything is possible and yet we're being presented with scenarios of, you know, our very near demise as a as a collective. And yet life is saying to us, anything is possible. Pay more attention to this field of loveliness that is growing, and expanding, rather than the field of crazy that is getting thinner and thinner every day. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I would say to people. Just hold to the idea that anything is possible. And in holding that idea, we hold space for that to, to really take root rather than the certainty of, oh my God, climate change is gonna kill us all. And you know, inflation is gonna mean we've got nothing to spend, you know, whatever it is. Anything is possible. Hold space for miracles to happen. That's what I would say, yeah. Beautiful. And this morning I was scraping the paint off one of the windows in the summer house. And I kept getting the words, and it wasn't even related to anything in particular. I kept getting, anything is possible. Anything. <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? It's totally crazy. How beautiful, How beautiful is that? Huh? And I was thinking, yeah, someone will just come up with what? Elephants can fly? That's <laughs> possible. <laughs> but anything is possible if you're in the right seats. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think our awakening is more than a possibility. You know, it's a, it's a growing reality every day. And uh, it's important that we pay attention to that because that's, that's what feeds us, you know, rather than paying attention to what literally empties us out. Um, yeah, I mean, literally where we pay our attention is where we get our results now, so. So yes. And couldn't Dumbo fly with his ears anyway? I think, I I think he, that was how he flew, wasn't it? With his ears? Yeah. It's a long so, time since I've seen that film. <laughs> so elephants can fly. They can, they can. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. I've yeah. so really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, it really has. I'd love to have you back one day. I'd love to, uh, yeah, I'd love to take you up on that. Uh, I'll send you a slice of pie. <laughs> oh, don't tell me. Don't tell me. <laughs> and thank you to everybody who's been with us either 
either live or on the replay. I can't believe how much time has passed. That's just, yeah. Good. <laughs> sorry to have kept not that we set a time but sorry to have kept you no I'm not sorry actually it's been awesome <laughs> yeah so thank you thank you everybody I will um stop the live stream now <laughs>